Hi everybody, uh, welcome to Layer 1 2011. Uh, I'm be, I will be your first talk for the day. All right, I get to stand here. All right, all right, guys, welcome to Layer 1. I hope you guys can all hear me. Sounds good. Uh, I'm the first talk of the day, so I'll go ahead and get it started. I hope that everybody's awake. Uh, the talk I'm going to be giving is regarding web application security, primarily from the standpoint of a system administrator. So we're not going to be editing the code. We're not going to be changing things that are the actual problems. We're going to be dealing with uh, you know, the server side of things and doing the best we can without having to mess with the coder's actual work. Um, specifically, this is for the Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP, Python, etc. scenario. So no luck for you guys and your Windows administrators and such. Uh, so a little intro is uh, I'm Robert Raleigh. I work security and abuse for dreamhost.com. Uh, uh, probably, I hope everybody's kind of heard of them. Anything, nothing, no interaction. Awesome. Everybody is asleep. Uh, yeah, we host uh, a few websites out there. It's a primarily shared hosting, which allows us to bump up to something around a million plus websites that we host or something like that. So. It's a, it's a good number, uh, and it's an interesting experience because I cannot edit our customer's code directly. Even how stupid it can be, we can't just go in and fix their you know, obviously badly coded sites. Uh, we can't upgrade their versions of WordPress or PHP bulletin board without their like, confirmation. So I have to be sitting on the end of the server administrator side of things and protecting their sites that are obviously vulnerable uh, from getting attacked and getting compromised because it's obviously also our fault, apparently every time that I get these emails, it's your fault. Uh, you have to stop this. I'm like, all right. So uh, before I really get started into the depth of the talk and the details, uh, anybody, this is, this is actually a bit of a beginner's talk, a beginner intermediary talk. Um, the first thing to do uh, if you're not doing this is to get a good backup system in place. Um, don't start worrying about security if you're not doing backups because you're two steps ahead and you're going to screw yourself in the end. Uh, they're absolutely first priority. If you're in a work environment, they will cover your ass uh, in case shit goes bad. Uh, being able to back up and say, oh, yeah, everything just, uh, the server exploded. Uh, I've got backups, though. So uh, otherwise, you, you get fired, and then that's done. No matter how much you say it was somebody else's fault, uh, and it was somebody else's responsibility for backups, you never assume somebody else is doing them. Uh, you either get a confirmation, you can see the backups are working and functional, or you do them yourself and make sure that they're working and they're functional. Uh, again, otherwise, you will probably not be going to be in a job very much longer. Uh, they're an excellent asset in regards to post-attack uh, post forensics, as you can do uh, basically code comparison. You can see what has been changed, what has been edited. Uh, you can you know, not only fix the things, you can see exactly what the attackers were doing and why they were doing this. So you can, see, you can get information about motives and uh, be more prepared against exactly what they're doing. Uh, Certainly have uh, multiple backups. Don't trust a, a backup directory on your server, because like I said, you know what? Servers can explode. So that would lose everything all in one swoop, fell swoop. It's real basic. And uh, it's also good to store your backups on read-only media, like a CDR, CDR, things like that. That way, the attackers can't mess with your backups as well. Uh, and uh, getting to how there are many different ways to, uh, to back up your data. And there's a lot of options out there. That's its own talk, its own reasoning, whole ba uh, managing like data owners, things like that. It's its own thing. Uh, don't worry about it too much. You can just use rsync. You can use tar. You can just back up data onto a different server uh, just using SCP, crap like that. It's really easy. But I highly recommend using uh, at least getting uh, version control systems in place on your uh, environment, especially if you have multiple developers or people working in teams. Uh, mostly because you can review to see who's changing what, and you can identify if the code that was changed was due to an attacker's actions or due to malicious employee's actions, uh, or if it was just you know somebody doing something really dumb and editing things out of uh, the, re the repository. Uh, let's see. As well as the last uh, point there is uh, having a code repository doesn't mean you don't have to keep backups. They, are not, they should not be considered your backup system. They should just be considered a repository, its own system. And you should also keep your backups of your repository somewhere else in the same way, same fashion, same idea for backups. Uh, just you know, keep it off server, different place, different location, everything like that. 
All right. So now, actually getting into the talk. <laughs> Hooray. Uh, so the, this talk will go over six basic concepts, really easy. Uh, there are three different types of attacks, all web-based, so cross-site scripting, SQL injection, insecure code, uh, as well as the defense, presuming that you're a sysadmin. Uh, you'll be able to do application level defense uh, methods using mod security, it's Apache, uh, popular Apache uh, module, as well as a network level defense using Snort as an intrusion detection system, and uh, file tampering detection uh, utilizing iNotify is what this talk's gonna cover. I also talked a little bit about Tripwire, but uh, I redid the talk for an open source conference, so I had to choose all free stuff. Uh, any questions so far before I get into the nitty gritty? None at all. Wait. I gotta go faster? <laughs> all right. First, ta first attack, cross-site scripting. There are three basic types of cross-site scripting attacks. There's reflected, stored, and DOM attacks. The reflected attacks are pretty much their variables that are passed along in the URL. They exist only in the browser for the viewer at the time. And it's a real simple idea of basically the information that's in the get request or the post request that's being, that's the person is being tricked to click on is gonna modify something on that page. It's gonna do something really unexpected and different. Uh, you guys probably have seen something like this on Facebook recently with your friends who are now messaging you about like their new favorite like, you know, man walks in on like daughter or some weirdness. Uh, stored attacks are slightly different, mostly because the attack uh, injection is stored in the database somewhere. That way, every subsequent view of that page is going to basically identify, have this attack code in it, and it's going to do something malicious, or it's going to do something unexpected, and it's going to change the, the layout of the page, make the browsers work against, uh, for whatever the attacker's purpose is. And the third type is DOM attacks, which are a little bit tricky, because it's basically, uh, they're changing the JavaScript DOM attributes in the browser. Uh, and this is actually really, really, I've forgotten exactly how to initiate those attacks, but anybody know? Firebug, Firebug is, yeah. But it's basically like utilizing JavaScript to change things, things like that. So it's a little trickier, it's not really well seen, uh, it's not really like widespread, things like that. Uh, so it's not too much of a worry uh, in regards to this aspect, but it's just, it's a third type. Uh, it's just specific to the DOM attributes in the browser. Uh, as, yeah, as it says on the bottom, uh, anybody who visits the page or the link will uh, get malicious code injected via the browser, and it will do malicious things, uh, change information on the page, execute JavaScript. Uh, you can get the browser to do actions that are new and unexpected and completely different, mostly because once you have access to the visitor's browser, you can get them to do all sorts of crazy shit with utilizing Flash, iframes, JavaScript, and this old new HTML5 stuff, which is, is coming out. So. Browsers are becoming powerful tools in attacks. Uh, quick and dirty examples is the, uh, basically a comment on, I believe this is a WordPress blog, and this is like WordPress version 2.8 or 2.9. It just allowed you to put a script alert right there in the comments, and every time somebody would visit the page, it would pop up something that says, you know, uh, you know your cross-site scripting inject uh, uh, ex uh, vulnerable. Uh, this is pretty much the typical one whenever any cross-site scripting is uh, is identified and verified in the, in the wild. Somebody says, oh, look, you know, this is vulnerable. You put in that little script and everybody who visits the page e quickly and easily sees that, yes, it is blatantly uh, vulnerable. Uh, to get a little bit more tricky on things, you can utilize, like I mentioned, uh, iframes. Uh, anything, the, any HTML that the browser understands or scripting language like JavaScript that the browser understands, you can get it to execute the code. And like I mentioned uh, previously, if you're really good with JavaScript, be really good with tweaking with uh, what browsers are doing. You can get these browsers to do interesting, new, and different things and unexpected things. Uh, like, here's a good example. Here I utilize the JavaScript uh, document.get element by ID and change the settings for one of the objects in, on, on the page, which actually changed the posts, what its content was. And I, put, I, I place the value to whatever I please. Uh, and boom, the entire post content on this WordPress blog uh, turned into whatever I wanted. Uh, if you could do this on, let's say, a news site, you could edit just little small uh, parts of the article, uh, and there's no, I mean, their database will look the same because it is injected somewhere else in the database, and they're not going to, not going to understand why their page, even though it's a news report, uh, is popping up and it's talking about, you know, slight differences. When they look at it in the back end, it looks all correct, but on the fore end, it's mi uh, misinformation. 
So a quick recap before cross-site scripting is it is uh, limited in its ability. However, that is primary strength. Uh, the majority of developers for the last five to 10 years don't really think that this is a threat, don't think it's a problem. Um, unfortunately, like I mentioned, like misinformation, uh, JavaScript, tricky JavaScript things, you can go really crazy with this. And you, if, you, if I could focus a whole hour just on cross-site scripting, there can be some crazy ass stuff that you, you could really uh, pull off. Uh, the best thing to do if you want to get into cross-site scripting is familiarize yourself with uh, uh, the small differences between persistent, reflected, and DOM cross-site scripting attacks, and study JavaScript intensely, uh, as well as any other scripting language that browsers will be able to understand, because that's where you're going to be able to do crazy-ass things that are unexpected, uh, difficult to track down, and pretty much put, put an end to everything. So for defenses on against this, I'm going to talk about mod security. Uh, before I continue, any questions about cross-site scripting? No. All right. I'm going to assume that I explained it extraordinarily well with lots of ums and ohs. Uh, so now on to the defense, mod security. It's a Apache module, like I mentioned. It will quickly allow you to quickly mitigate and prevent, uh, as well as identify attacks. Uh, you will need to uh, be running Apache, and you'll need to install mod security as a module uh, in your configuration. Uh, it's a real simple, uh, it's supposed to be, and uh, my laser does not work at that distance. All right, so uh, right here, a little blue section, it's pretty much what it looks like in the Apache configuration. It's not complicated to get it loaded in, it's not hard, uh, but you will have to recompile if, uh, or reconfigure and, re uh, and restart your service. Uh, all you need to do is get some rules. Uh, it's a basic fingerprint rule, uh, rule-based uh, module and uh, intrusion detection and prevention system. Uh, here is a list of variables that you get to uh, review in your fingerprint identification. Uh, it's a long list. Unfortunately, you know you guys can take your notes, and I'll be here for like 20 minutes, so you keep writing this down, uh, or you can get the slides. Uh, you can also download a large list of predefined or pre-made rules from either gotroot.com or OWASP.org, those are both good sources for getting a basic, a basic list of fingerprints to identify attacks and prevent them. However, when you're building out mod security and you're doing this in actual infrastructure, don't just download their stuff and say, oh, I'm done. It's not how that works. You have to constantly be reviewing your rules, identifying new, new attacks, as well as updating your rule sets. I think Gotroot uh, updates their rules every month. So you can always get more stuff and review the attacks. Um, also, you have to be smart because mod security will run on Windows servers as well, because Apache is, will run on Windows servers. Uh, if you're running a Linux server or a Windows server, don't load the rules that are specific for the other operating system. It's just a waste of your memory on your server. All right. Here's a quick rule to stop that, uh, that cross-site scripting injection attack that I showed you just a minute ago. Uh, the sec rule is uh, request file name is the variable name. And so it says basically if you're requesting a WordPress comments post, uh, if it sees that file, uh, look at the, the chain rule says, look at the next rule in this uh, event on, on the page. And the deny says, well, I'm going to deny it. That's your action. That's what you're going to do. Uh, the second rule says args colon comment, uh, which is the comment argument. It makes pretty easy sense. Uh, if it includes a script or an iframe or something like that, something that's HTML or something that just shouldn't look right, uh, you know, you're going to deny this. And it's going to basically stop the attack in its tracks. Uh, here's a second rule, an overzealous version says any argument, uh, any variables that are passed along via the browser to the site, if they have scripts or iframes, just deny it. It's much simpler, but obviously with every fingerprint rule base set and every intrusion detection system, you're going to have to vary between uh, stopping attacks and allowing users to actually use the site. So you, know, you can get really tricky with these things and you can just say, screw you guys. If you ever do any open brackets or greater than signs or less than signs, like you're just going to be denied. Unfortunately, you're going to also get a constant flow of people emailing you like, why can't I post on the site? Uh, also, uniquely in uh, the environment that I work in, because it's so many websites, even though I'm doing, I could do something similar to this and it makes perfect sense to me. Like there's no reason anybody's ever going to do this injection of this script or this, an iframe in a comment form for WordPress. Uh, there will still be people that email you saying, why can't I comment like with this script? I'm just talking about JavaScript in this page. I'm like, well, because that's bad for security. But you have to find that nice middle grounds where uh, you know, users can actually still use the site and it's uh, applicably secure for your needs. So 
back to uh, the earlier rules of those cross-site scripting attacks, the exact same attacks uh, on your browser. Uh, when they go to the page and they try to commit a comment that has a script or an iframe in it, they just get a forbidden page. Uh, you may notice that the, uh, it's blatant what's happening here, and the attacker is going to clearly identify, oh, crap, they are blocking me with an intrusion detection system. Uh, so that means they're going to modify their style uh, of attack. They're going to do different things. They're going to do, uh, I think you actually, you've heard this talk before. And you mentioned that something that was smart. You do a, like basically encoding. Uh, instead of uh, using standard like UTF uh, or ASCII, you just change that to the next type, and it'll get around it. You can do HTML encoding. That'll get around it. And this is the cat and mouse game that you're always going to play in security that everybody knows. You're going to provide a prevention method, and they're going to provide a new unique type of attack that basically did the same thing in a little different way, and it gets around your fingerprints. And it's, that's why you say always update your rules, always review your logs see what's going on, and always adapt. So that's the quick little mod security recap here. Uh, the pros are it really good at uh, preventing attacks. It is application level, which is a key concept on this, that it will allow you to get into the, far, into the attack and prevention right there at the application level, which supersedes anything like SSL, decryption, anything else. You get a lot of access to variables that are right down uh, at the application level versus uh, trying to decrypt packets and figure, thing out, figure things out from there, which I'll get into with Snort in a second. It's more difficult. And uh, it's a very flexible rule set. So you have a large supply of variables to, to work off of, as well as which allows you to make very dynamic rules, uh, fingerprints, and things like such. Uh, it is also extendable with scripting. Uh, anybody here knows Lua by any chance? You guys either don't have right arms or nobody knows Lua. Limited yeah. User what? Limited user account. Limited user account. All right. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, Lua is a basic object oriented scripting language. If you know any other object oriented language, you're going to understand Lua pretty quickly, pretty easily. You're going to be able to pick it up. I really like Lua. Uh, it's actually coming in pretty strongly in the security community. Uh, Nmap scripting uh, uses Lua. I believe uh, uh, Wireshark, I believe, uses Lua. And obviously now mod security uses Lua. And everybody's, it's, it's really easy scripting language to implement in your pre-existing code, like C code, things like that. So these really powerful tools are becoming more powerful because you can use scripting. And you can start automating notifications, or you can start automating a, a prevention methods. You can, you can do all sorts of crazy shit, because well, now you have a script that has access to everything at the application level, all those variables that I just mentioned. Uh, in mod security, and you can start doing uh, comprehensive changes to like your firewall rule sets on the fly, things like that. Uh, the con is it is only as powerful the, as the rules you use and choose to use. So like I mentioned, if you just download stuff from GotRoot or OWASP and it's last year's rule sets, you won't be preventing any new attacks. Uh, so always keep up to date with all your stuff. Uh, and also, as well as I mentioned, uh, bad rules will cause false positives. Uh, and it is detectable by attackers, so they can just change, simply change their attack methods. They're going to get around your rule set, and it's going to keep that game going. Any questions about mod security? No. Good. I think I'm good on time. Am I right? Anybody have the time? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So the next uh, method of attack is SQL injection. You guys probably can't see it up there, but this is a nice little picture I found on the internet a while ago, actually. It's the car that was trying to trick the, the uh, stoplight cameras. And his license plate changed to, from a standard license plate to something like, you know, drop database, you know, like user, user IDs, things like that. It, in, all, in all hopes, they were hoping that the, whatever the, the security cameras were, they would try to store that value and then inadvertently drop the entire database and, get, and save everybody. Very Fight Club-esque. <laughs> Start over with nothing. So uh, I'm going to go over SQL injection with this popular WordPress plugin called PhotoRacer. It's actually not popular. It was like one version, and it was severely vulnerable. And the guy just gave up and ran away. <laughs> so it's the same basic WordPress site. It's like this is an older version of WordPress. Uh, so don't think that I'm bagging on WordPress for this. It's just my my base example for all my tests. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is the plugin. Uh, pl WordPress plugins aren't the same as WordPress, so some of the plugins kind of suck, and they will be vulnerable to really nasty stuff like this. Uh, right up here is a simple request for a page. Uh, it just kind of displays some pictures, some terrible stuff. I didn't use it. It was actually the plugin was also all in Italian, so this is fun. Um, 
you basically prepend some stuff to the, uh, the select query, or sorry, not the select query, the, uh, the get request at the end. You throw in some SQL uh, queries right there. You just simply add the union select 01234 user login. Uh, those 01234s are just buffers. Again, uh, is everybody here familiar with SQL injection or at least SQL? I mean, mo this, this stuff has been around for uh, five or more years, so uh, I'm just kind of quickly going through it. If you, anybody has any specific questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand. It's sort of a beginner talk, so if there are any beginners out there, raise your hand so you understand it at least. Uh, if there's anybody who's an expert out there, raise your hand so I can understand it better. <laughs> uh, it's a real simple, uh, simple thing. You just simply add your SQL query to the end in the code, which I'm going to get into shortly. Right here, yeah. Uh, this is what basically happens. The variable is direct. Uh, the variable for image ID is directly copied over from the request ID, which was that long string in the re get request. Uh, in the actual SQL query right here, there's no escaping that uh, that value that's added in there. So anything is just added onto the end of the select query that's b being made right here. Uh, that's the problem. They didn't escape it, and it's easy to just add more things onto that query. When it's returned back, you get access to anything else you chose to select, things like that. The expected, uh, in the, here you go, there's, a, there's the example. The expected SQL query looks like this, image ID is 10. Uh, when you do the attack, it looks like image ID is a negative one. Also do a union to select some more variables. And then it gets printed back out on the page, like you'll see here. Uh, in this example, uh, why it's a problem is you can just pull the user password and you have a hash of the password. Run it through a simple and quick de uh, decryptor or dehasher, things like that and you'll eventually get the admin password. Once you can log into the WordPress admin account, they won't even understand how they were attacked because you, know, you have the password, and they'll just wonder, whoa, crap, why was I, you know, why was I logging in from Italy, or why was I logging in from Romania? Like, this makes no sense. Um, also, I believe by default, WordPress doesn't, log, uh, doesn't keep track of logins uh, to their admin panel, so there's no, there would be no recollection to, as to who or how this, these people were looking, logging into the system. Uh, but there are plugins to fix that, and hopefully the plugins don't make things worse. So, so as a quick recap on SQL injection, uh, it does require a basic understanding or a comprehensive understanding of SQL. Uh, if you don't know SQL, don't do SQL injection. If you don't know JavaScript, don't do cross-site scripting injection. You actually don't do any attacks if you don't know these things. Go learn shit. Uh, it's very noisy if the database structure is not known. So while the attacker is trying to get, collect information, the logs are going to show a lot of weird get requests, things like that. Uh, so it's going to come up as there's clearly somebody trying to do something that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, you know, when every, and when everybody requesting the site is always get uh, you know, page ID 1, get page ID 25, and then get page ID union select. And it's like, oh, that looks really bad. Uh, it's also very time consuming if you choose to do it by hand, uh, which is just stupid, fun, but stupid because you'll have to sit there manually typing in all these queries. Uh, but there are actually tools uh, to automate SQL injection. They'll grab every variable on the page and just start dumping uh, get requests and various SQL queries to it, trying to escape, trying to get more data back. And once they see something that's, once they catch on to something on the page, they'll report back to the penetration tester uh, saying, here is a, you know, here's a summary of what I found on the page. These variables are likely where you can initiate an attack. Uh, uh, they can also do more than select. The last query just I showed select is because the kindest, nicest way to do an SQL injection. Uh, you can do anything that you, that uh, the database user has access to on that table, which includes dropping, altering, creating. Uh, these are also SQL queries. I presume you know them all. Uh, but basically, you can delete the entire database or add new users to the to the database. Uh, this is also key to remember uh, in SQL, uh, if anybody here is a database administrator, if you have a WordPress site or a WordPress user for your database, just give them the access they need. And just a simple concept of least privilege, just let them do what they need to do. Don't give that use, don't log into WordPress with your database's root uh, user. It's just dumb. So any questions on SQL injection? I'm going through this really quickly, guys. I need questions. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, continue on to the defense, which is intrusion, uh, intrusion detection systems as well as intrusion prevention systems. Snort is an intrusion detection system. It will review packets on the wire and log them if it identifies something is looks malicious. Uh, at least it allows you to, 
It will allow you to take all the data going across the wire, summarize it into what you just identify as malicious attacks, and take the appropriate action otherwise. Uh, there are add-ons for Snort that are just basically going to review those logs that are made, and if they identify that a user, or an IP address, sorry, is uh, constantly attacking your server, you can quickly block them. Uh, you can choose to report it to the, the ISP in Romania, and they'll be, I'm certain, happy to do whatever you need. Uh, it's an excellent method to monitor network traffic. Um, also, uh, if you are doing Snort with an intrusion prevention system, don't forget your whitelist. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna, first thing you're going to do is you're going to test a rule, and your intrusion prevention system is going to block you out, and then you're going to be calling the network operation center saying you, that you need somebody to hook up a crash cart because you just blocked your IP address, or you're going to get another IP address. So Snort, very easy uh, to install. Uh, literally, this is the page, uh, this is copied from their website, and it is actually that easy. You just verify you have the, the requirements, which is, in this case, a Linux server. That's perfectly fine. Uh, download it, install it. Uh, Ubuntu makes it extraordinarily easy with apt-get, all these package managers. Snort is probably in a package manager already. You can just go install it via ports, packages, whatever. Um, it's widely, very widely used. It's also very lightweight, so it's not going to bog down your server, especially with the speed of servers today. It's not going to slow things down too much at all. You're probably never even going to notice it unless you have an absurdly large fingerprint file, which is trying to detect everything in your mom. Um, Snort can detect uh, more than just web application attacks. Uh, unlike Mod Security, Mod Security is application level just with the web application level. Uh, Snort's going to do anything on your network. This includes uh, brute force at attacks, brute, um, anything else, any other port, any other service. It can actually stop, prevent, or at least just detect. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, yeah, Snort by itself will only log the attacks for review. You're going to have to use a, an add on like uh, Snort SAM or Guardian.pl. It will turn into an intrusion prevention system by simply all they do is uh, use IP, your IP firewalls, like IPF Wadham or whatever your IP tables are, and it will actually block that, uh, that attacker from being able to access you on the network stack anymore. All right, so an example code in uh, Snort is, uh, looks something like this. Uh, it's an alert request for uh, TCP attacks or TCP stream uh, against the external network. Uh, this looks really bad, but if you guys are familiar, once you guys get familiar with the uh, the uh, fingerprint file and how it's all set up and the variables that you get used to, it makes really sense and it's really quick and easy. HTTP servers and HTTP ports, these are all variables with a little dollar sign in front. Uh, the blue ones are the only ones that really matter for the integrity of this. You can kind of just ignore the rest. But like I said, it'll make sense once you get familiarized with the, uh, with the fingerprint files and how, how they're set up. The URI content uh, variables are your view image.php without a case. Uh, URI content ID, union select, basically all these things are basically lumped in together. If you have something in the URA that looks like view image and it has an ID equals and a union and a select and it starts looking like SQL queries, then these things are looking bad. This won't protect all SQL injection as a default, which a lot of people do, uh, which is a much better way to set up this rule. This just focuses primarily on that one attack against that one plugin. So this is a bad example for SQL injections in general, but a good example for that one specific attack. Um, yeah, and this is exactly what it would detect, anything that kind of looks like this. Uh, and we will, like I mentioned, Snort will just log it, and this is about what the log looks like. It's a lot of gibberish, but it basically is SQL injection attempt, which is that special message that's identified right there. And you can go through these logs later, especially if you're doing the logs against a large network of, of systems. You're just going to go through the logs later. You're going to parse out just for what you want. You're going to create a met. You're going to basically create a metric. You're going to do graphs, do all that crazy nice management stuff, and uh, just review it later. Nobody, I hope nobody here is actually going to manually go through every log by hand because that that will get tedious. Uh, but I guess if you're getting paid really well, just do that <laughs> all day long. Just read your logs. Uh, Snort SAM Guardian.pl turns Snort into an intrusion prevention system. Like I mentioned, it just adds an IB table rule to uh, drop all connections from the attacker's IP address. Uh, it's real simple. It's at a different level than, the, uh, than Snort and things like that, but uh, pretty works, works out pretty well. Yeah. They... Yeah, and I'll mention it again for the DVD. Uh, whitelist your IP address before you actually initiate these rules, because you will probably block yourself. And then you'll be upset that you can't access your site again and you can't work on the server that you're supposed to be working on. So, yep, as a quick recap, the pros to Snort are that it's very light, lightweight. It runs independently of everything else. You can run it on any system pretty much you want. You can even build out a firewall 
utilizing uh, Snort as basically a transparent firewall on your network, utilizing Snort just to log stuff, and have a dedicated machine just for that. Uh, it runs independently, it's powerful, it's very powerful as an intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention system. Don't get the two confused, don't think that you have to do both, just choose one or the other, uh, and you can implement it in excellent ways on your network. Uh, it is network level, as I'm also as I mentioned already. It's got a large user base, which is really good. It's got a huge user base where basically all those uh, fingerprint files, you can find lots of examples. You can get on their snort forums and you can talk to people saying, hey, this rule doesn't work for me. This rule did work for me in these interesting different ways or so on and so forth. Uh, and as an intrusion prevention system, it will stop the attack from happening. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, previously with mod security, Snort will follow the same uh, problem, is that the attackers will know that you're stopping their attack from happening, but the key difference is that with uh, Snort is you're actually just blocking them on the entire network. They can't continue their attack in interesting and different ways. They're going to have to wait until they're unblocked or they get a new IP address to continue to attempt to hack or go after your server or your system. Uh, the negative is, again, same as mod security. It's, uh, only as good as the rules that you set. If you use last year's rules, they're going to be useless for you for any new attacks. Uh, it can cause false positives, which does upset people when they get blocked from the server when they're just doing something that they thought was okay. Uh, and it can be very, it become very daunting and large to customize, due to, uh, which is a good and bad thing because it has a large followers. You can get a lot of fingerprint files. Uh, yeah, have fun reading through 5,000 uh, fingerprints to verify which ones really are necessary for your, your implementation, which ones are useless. Uh, but, you know, again, if you're getting paid well, just go through that. <laughs> Spend all day doing that. Uh, it also requires a third-party script to become an intrusion prevention system, which is okay, but uh, not really like what you would presume is, is how things would be handled. You'd expect it to be all in one good package, but it works. And, uh, any questions on Snort? Yes. You just looked that up on your Google phone, dude. I remembered it and I looked up that. <laughs> no, I have not. Uh, what is Suricata? It's supposed to be it's supposed to be basically a stored alternative. Apparently the Department of Homeland Security gave someone some money and uh, they started developing apparently. They say it's faster, of course it is. And it's there's no back doors in that at all. No. no. Trust trust the DHS. Oh, that's actually cool. Yeah, and um, the thing is that they have fairly new feature set. Uh, so it, it, it has a little more work to be done, but maybe another year. Uh, it's kind of like a beta. Oh. It's really cool. Well, it's, a, it's a gecko peeing on a bush. That's, that's their logo? That's like, how it looks, actually. <laughs> it's a gecko peeing on a bush. Look for that. If I remember, it's basically a, a, a smart. Was it, was it actually the same developers, or no? No. 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 Oh. So, so there are new additions to Snort now, and in the next year or so, get on it now so you're in the base and be like, I know something better. Uh, and then I'll update my talk. <laughs> uh, but very cool. Uh, any other questions, concerns? Very good. Hopefully I'm doing good on the time, because uh, this is running short. Now we're going to go into attacks against code vulnerabilities. Uh, I was going to do like other types of attacks, but this one's actually pretty funny because of how I came across uh, to figure it out and put it into this talk. Uh, your code can be attacked directly. Uh, the number one fault is going to be trusting user input. It's a real basic concept. This is why cross-site scripting works. This is why SQL injection works. And this is just straight up in your code. You did something stupid, and now, the, now they're doing whatever the hell they want on your site. So the attack is going to utilize this badly coded upload form. Uh, this is why it's funny, because this, was the, this is the, something that I see a lot of, a uh, really bad upload form that just allows people to upload PHP files or whatever, anything executable by the Apache server. Um, this was me searching Google for PHP upload form, and this was the first result I got. So I'm going to presume that a lot of people are using this exact code. Uh, for, the, um, it, for the safety and like sanctity of the people that actually wrote this and gave this example online, uh, a, it may have changed by now in Google search results. B, um, they actually say it's not secure to use in development environments. Unfortunately, I don't think anybody who's a new budding PHP programmer gives a crap about that, so they're just going to use a really bad, insecure form. Uh, as I mentioned, it, allow you, it will allow the users to upload anything in, uh, with executable extensions, so the server's going to happily execute the PHP code that you just uploaded to the site, the Perl, the CGI, et cetera. Uh, Here's the exact code 
that was found on this uh, how-to page, and that's exactly how it works. Uh, I just copied and pasted it into a PHP file and ran it on the my Apache system, and happily uploaded a PHP file. Uh, you think uh, you know it's going to be hard to write a PHP file to do exactly what I want? I'm going to have to customize it. Uh, there's a huge list of PHP sh backdoor shells uh, from shells.org, sh3 llz, and I'm not trying to pimp for them, but it's a really nice database. Uh, and you can upload any of their shells. You can download it from their site for free. Uh, they don't care. And you can upload shells that look like this, and that are nasty and terrible because they allow you to do anything you want on the file system, anything you want on the server. Uh, yeah, there's, there's the upload page, and there's the shell. It expected some image. It's like, oh, happy, thanks for uploading that image.php. And then this is the actual backdoor shell, which will allow complete access and control of the system that's available there. Any questions about that terribleness? Is it down? Good. Uh, you're not even on the internet. <laughs> SH3 LLZ. Uh, search Google for backdoor shell PHP shells. That's uh, that's how I found out about that site. Just yeah, just go search Google. I should actually change that because I don't really want to pimp the site that has like 10,000 backdoor shells directly. It's a good and bad thing all at once. Uh, but it's a good thing because well, it's a bad thing because these are obviously easy to use for everybody because they did all the work and it provided you one location. It's a good thing for security people because now I can just download all those shells and now I have an identifier so I can. Tra track them down, find, identify them on our servers, and get rid of them really quick. Uh, file system monitoring. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, continue now. File monitoring, uh, I'm going to utilize I iNotify. Like I mentioned, I changed this talk a little bit for a uh, security conference, or for Scale, which is an open source security, or open source, uh, so Southern California Linux Expo is exactly what it is. Their focus is all open source stuff, so I, I used to do about Tripwire, which is uh, actually a really good utility as well. It's been around for a long time, but it does exactly what it needs to do, in my opinion. It takes an image of what your file system is supposed to look like and compares your files uh, every day or every so often and tells you when things are changing. Uh, doing this is key. Unfortunately, doing this is also very resource intensive. Uh, it's hard to find a, a way to be able to constantly monitor all your files without ca causing like a performance like reduction. iNotify does a good job of this because it's in the kernel. Uh, and so basically, it's, it'll create a hook for any time any changes are made to the file system, any, any calls are made in the kernel system, and, and then it will report this back and out to you saying, oh, these files are being changed. Uh, so I'll go ahead and continue. Now if I notify and you, I don't know how to spell, so I about lost that. Uh, it was a kernel module. It was released in 2.6.13, which is a while ago. It's been around for a while. Uh, it improved upon denotify if anybody's really old and says, oh, there's another tool. Uh, I notify is just the kernel module. You're going to have to utilize scripts uh, on top of it in order to do what you need to do, uh, such as reporting, uh, file system monitoring, so on and so forth. Uh, those tools are provided in the I notify tools set, which is probably what you want to look for on Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever. Uh, this is also Linux specific. If you're on a BSD box, you're going to have to use, uh, I think it was FSQ. Uh, but it does a very similar action, but in slightly different ways, because this is kernel specific. Uh, uh, the iNotify tools will include things like iNCron, iWatch, and PYNotify. Those are scripts that utilize iNotify to be able to do the things that iNotify is built to do. So iNotify tools, uh, these are a few uh, identifiers of the few tools that are available. And I forgot what they do. Sorry. Excellent quality. <laughs> quality. Huh. I believe that lib iNotify tools is just li the library that uh, you will be able to utilize to build things into like your C pro existing C programs, uh, so such like that. I notify wait will wait, wait to take an action uh, until it identifies a change in the file system. So you, you inform it to wait to watch a file when a file has been changed or modified or deleted or edited in whatever way that you tell it to wait for. Then it will take an a action. And I notify watch will uh, watch that file and continuously update. So I notify wait will do a one time action. I notify watch. Hey, I do remember. Uh, I notify I and cron quick and easy. Uh, those are two other. This is a I notify cron. Uh, I and cron is uh, really the script that's going to utilize the best. It's going to periodically check files for changes. Uh, uh, so it's really quick and easy to install. Just verify your kernel as I notify enabled and set up. Uh, you set up I and cron tab. It works just like a regular cron tab. 
it will just simply look at the instead, but instead of uh, actions taken on uh, dates and times at specific intervals, it will just simply watch a directory or a file name for changes and then run that command every time this a change is identified. And then you simply start your ioncron d daemon. Uh, here's an example of ioncron tab. Uh, it looks at a directory, home user website, uh, looks for created files, and sends an email to the admin of the website or whatever email address you want, stating a file was created. You can also include the name of the file, so it's quick and easy to make proper changes. Here's uh, an identifier, a list of those masks. It's a lot like fingerprints. Uh, here's a list, basically things that you're going to watch for, for either changes, deletes, access to files, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, the variable in ioncron-d, you can also pass it a series of variables, which uh, the first one is the sh worst one, but it's just a dollar sign. Uh, the at sign will be simply the watch file system information, uh, so on and so forth. That way you're actually getting a useful report and not just, oh my god, something changed, I don't know what it was. Uh, an example ioncron entry is down there at the bottom with uh, variables. And it looks a little bit more weird and spastic, but it'll provide a good, clear report. Um, there's also a different solution here. Uh, you can actually compare your live data to the backups, like I mentioned earlier in the talk. Uh, if you just use diff, the diff command can do more than just comparing files. You can actually compare file systems, which is really nice. It's a cool little utility uh, that a lot of people actually weren't really aware of. Um, so yeah, I'd simply use diff r against your live directory and your backup directory, and it will quickly, quickly identify which files are different. Uh, and here's a little visual representation. but. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the fastest way you're going to verify it if you have a good, clean backup to be able to stop or at least uh, be able to figure out what's changed and take the appropriate action. So uh, that's a lot like the defense. Uh, I'm going to go over the last little bit on defense. Uh, logs are key and important uh, for system administrators to be able to understand what's going on, how the attack worked, what was broken, and uh, how to fix it, at least help the, the, the developers fix it. Because you're going to a developer and saying, hey, uh, the database was broken into, and the guy's not going to know what the fuck to do. So he's gonna, you're going to have to be able to provide useful information for them, because they can't do it themselves. Uh, useful logs that you're going to have to know, uh, the Apache logs, the auth logs, FTP logs, et cetera, and so forth. If you have an intrusion detection system built out, hopefully, you're going to want to look at those logs as well. It's probably going to be your first place to go to. You're going to have to really memorize tool, uh, shell uh, tools like grep, awk, sed, so on and so forth. You're going to have to be really good at those things. Uh, you can get into it just knowing grep and awk. Uh, use the man page to figure out how they work if you don't know them already. But if you're a system admin, you better know those tools already. Uh, you can also utilize Perl to automate this scanning of the logs. Uh, like I mentioned earlier as well, uh, unless you're getting paid a lot of money and, and your boss doesn't care and you can sit around reading logs by hand all day, that's awesome for you. but. You're not going to get anything done if you have to look through millions of lines of logs every day. Uh, key information on looking over the logs. A lot of people say, I don't, you know, I'm going to have to manually look through everything. Find correlation of timestamps. Uh, that's the main part about looking at the logs, at least for me. I don't care that much about being able to manually look at things and say, oh, I think that's okay. I think that's bad. Let me look, see if I can find more information over there. Just correlate your timestamps. Uh, make sure you're running a network time daemon if you're running, uh, if you're comparing logs against multiple servers. That way, you can identify correlated events uh, via timestamps or also IP address to identify more about the attack, create a report about the attack, understand how the attack worked, and then update your fingerprint files on your intrusion detection systems or your your other uh, proxies and things like that, and stop this from happening. Uh, here's a good example of uh, data found in the logs. Uh, uh, sending the ioncron D will send you an email about a modified object name. Uh, you're going to find out the I know number, modified time, and change time. Uh, that's what I mentioned. It's key. Now you're going to be able to look through the website access logs, and uh, and you're going to look for that exact timestamp, and you're going to find out that yes, somebody made a post to the upload page, and now you know exactly how the attack worked, and you knew you know what to do, and you can tell the programmer that this page is broken. This page allowed this to be uploaded. So how am I on time? Any questions? No questions. All right, so as a quick wrap up, uh, writing secure code will prevent the need for any of this. Uh, writing secure, people writing secure code won't probably happen anytime soon. So like everybody, there will always be work for then the necessity for security by the system administrator. Uh, attacks are also mostly automated. The majority of attacks that I showed you here 
aren't being done by hand, aren't being done by people in, in their basements or their mom's house anymore. This is mostly bots, uh, and there are a lot of bots. Uh, they're happening to be attacking sites all the time. The second you identify, you start looking, you set up an intrusion detection system, and you start logging stuff, you're going to find out, oh shit, this was happening the entire time. You're going to see logs from like 100,000 attacks a day, things like that. Um, so from here on out, uh, continue to, uh, to research on your own. Like I mentioned, this is really a beginner talk, so it's supposed to be just like a sample of uh, various attacks and prevention methods. So feel free to take some of the information you learned in this, go Google it, go find out more. Uh, I have a list of URLs at the end of this talk uh, for anybody who is interested in it. Uh, I hope that most of them work. But uh, I can also give you a copy of the talk, uh, and I believe on the website uh, there will be a, a presentation. You'll be able to download it yourself. Uh, uh, there's other talks that I've been uh, considering giving, uh, but I haven't written. Uh, more about writing secure to code, more about penetration testing. Uh, a good example of a good talk is uh, why your firewall is racist. Uh, when you build automated, uh, uh, automated prevention systems, you're going to find out a lot of these attacks are from various other countries. And it's not the country's fault. It's not racist at all. It's just the fact that those countries have the open proxies that nobody, care nobody cares to break down or bring down. So they're where the, all these attacks are going to come from. And uh, also, uh, the select MBA is not equal to a DBA. Uh, for, that's more of a workplace and environment issue where people see, think that they have access, uh, that they're smart enough to have access, and they give themselves access, and they're not. Especially vital with uh, MBAs, people with MBAs trying to manage your database. Here's your list of uh, URLs, and if anybody has any further questions, no, very good. And that will be all. Hooray. Nope. Nope. You can email me at work, abuse at dreamist. <laughs> Don't email me.